This video is to introduce you to MongoDB, which is the database that we're going to use in this course. Um, there's a few different reasons for introducing MongoDB. Uh, MongoDB's original rationale themselves and where they got the name from was that it is a humongous database, a database designed for web systems that might, uh, for startups that might scale to enormous amounts of data really quickly and might need to scale across multiple machines quite quickly, uh, what's called sharding, where you put different parts of your data set onto different database servers. There's lots of controversy about whether it's really good for that. You'll find traditional database administrators say, uh, saying that this whole web scale thing is a bit of a nonsense and that Postgres, SQL, MySQL, etc., can also do this. Realistically, from my personal point of view, there's a few interesting things about MongoDB. One is that it is a document database, not a relational database. I'll explain that in a moment. And the other is that with MongoDB, it seems you can typically get away without having a database administrator until later. Um, that while you're a very small team uh, trying to put stuff up and cope with scale, that sometimes that's slightly easier to do uh, with MongoDB uh, though realistically, uh, it's going to be the document database thing that's going to drive that first, because very often if you're a very small team on a very young product, you don't quite know what you want in your database just yet. You haven't sorted out what your database scheme is going to be. And document databases let you play around with that a little bit. So I should explain the difference between a relational database and a document database. You'll see much more on relational databases if you do the database course. Um, but essentially, they saw tables with a fixed set of columns for every row. So here, I've represented storing a user object, and the user's got a name, Algernon, and they've got a, an ID, a primary key, uh, and this is user number one. And we're trying to say that, well, these users might have some social identities. So a user might have a GitHub login, they might have a Twitter login, if we're doing OAuth stuff. They might have various different kinds of sessions. But you can't put an array of stuff into a row of a table. So what you end up having to do is have an association table. Um, basically, another table that has the array and that has a set of columns with the data on it. So here we've got the users table that's just got basic field data about the user. But we've then got the user identities table that has uh, a list of um, Identi social identities for this user. So there's the GitHub one, there's the Twitter one, and they're associated with the user by what's called a foreign key. So in that user column in user identities is a foreign key from this table to this table. Uh, so the one of these with ID one, and the database can do various checks to make sure that that exists and stays consistent. And similarly, we have a user sessions table because the user might have multiple sessions. But so this means that what might be in a, a single object structure up in our Java code, we've got the user and we've got a list of identities and we've got a list of sessions and objects in those lists, ends up being spread across multiple tables in, uh, in a relational database. And you need to do joins on it and interesting things like that. A document database is a little bit different. Um, so a document database stores a collection of documents, and these are usually quite close to JSON documents. So here I've described that same user as a JSON document. And um, this is kind of as a, as a slightly MongoDB'd uh, JSON document. So they've got an ID, and in this case that's a field underscore ID. But there's kind of this funny type here, object ID with some stuff in it. And I, I just typed this one in, so it would, that actually wouldn't be a valid object ID. It's the wrong length. Um, but anyway, there, there, there's a type called object ID that I'll explain in a moment um, that we would uh, we would have the, the, the ID as being. But so generally, we've got these fields here. And so here, for instance, we have a field. And the data that's within it is an array. Because, well, JSON, you can have arrays of JSON data in, um, in, in, in fields in a JavaScript object. And in this case, we have our identities and we have a little JSON sub-document for each of those identities. Service, GitHub, username, Algernon, 123497, or whatever it is. 
And similarly, down here we have an array of active sessions, and in this case we happen to only have one sub-document in that array. So th this is quite a different style of storage, from splitting it across multiple tables to storing these things like the JSON documents. The other curious thing about it is that because this is a collection of documents, the documents in the collection don't have to have all the same fields. We can have this document's got this set of fields, that document's got a slightly different set of fields. Um, so whereas in a table, all of the tables have well the same, uh, the same column headings. So when are they useful? The first one, and this is kind of realistically the, 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 the most realistic use uh, for it, where it's kind of an obvious user document database, is if you're going to need a collection that's got heterogeneous documents. If you try and store objects that have lots of different fields in a relational database, then you end up kind of with interesting problems around how you do the tables. Do we put all of the possible different column headings that all of the different things might have there? Do we try breaking some bits of it up into different tables and doing joins? And it can be conceptually a little bit, a little bit complicated. Um, whereas in a document database, well, they, the, the document has the field it needs and it goes into the collection. And we can index on some sub uh, set of, of those fields and it all kind of goes along fairly merrily. Uh, so the example that I tend to use for this is I did, I kind of rolled my own little Facebook-like um, uh, teaching software. And so the idea was that you had rolling content would appear and some of that content would be uh, YouTube videos, some of that content would be PDF, some of it would be Google Slides, and all of those things end up needing different kinds of fields. Um, the YouTube one, well, it needs the video ID. Um, the uh, other ones, there were some markdown documents that needed uh, the name, the description, but then needed the actual markdown text, the content of it. But they all needed to be in the same collection because they all needed to appear uh, on this very simple stream of content appearing. And so the easiest way to do that was just, well, use a document database, put them all in the same collection. And uh, in that case, it could be programmatically fairly simple and quick to, quick to put together. The other reasons you'll tend to come across for people using something like MongoDB is because you don't define what all the column headings are, uh, you'll often get find that people will experiment uh, putting a system together using MongoDB um, because not everything in in the table has to have the the same uh, the same set of fields, and so it's kind of quite easy to write your code, try it out. Oh no, that didn't work. Let's add a field here. Let's take a field away there, and the history of what's in the collection all gets terribly messy. But you're kind of quite quickly experimenting with it without having to mutate tables in, in the database. Um, the third one I've suggested, and this is partly the motivation for putting it onto this uh, onto this course. Uh, main motivation was actually, oh, you see all these all these relational databases in the other units. Let's show you this different kind of database. Um, if your data is going to be document shaped anyway, so you've been writing a web system that's got a JSON API, and those are JSON documents going up to the client. So you already have to describe your data as a document. Uh, so at the at the database layer, perhaps it would be nice and easy if you could store something document shaped in your database as well. Um, if you start a company and your company starts to grow, it's quite possible that you'll end up later on deciding, no, 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 there's various wrinkles with MongoDB that we're not happy with and so we'll shift to Postgres later on. Uh, but it is quite common for, um, for teams to uh, start off with MongoDB um, uh, on, on, on some occasions and some of them do stay uh, stay on it long term so it, lots of products these days use multiple different kinds of database um, I, I know some of the people who uh, worked on the UQ end of edX where they would receive their logs of what all the students interacted with their MOOCs up on edX.org and they would put all of that log data into a MongoDB database to do their processing because, well, they're not yet sure exactly what sorts of um, what sorts of views and analytics they might want to, to do on all of this user behavior. And because it's log data coming from someone else, they can't define a strict schema for it because they can't constrain what fields there are in the log data that they're given. 
Okay, there's another difference you might come across is a difference in how IDs are typically handled. So the one I showed at the beginning, this is sort of a very traditional way of doing the ID allocation. The IDs are sequential. The first one that goes into the database is number one. The next one that goes into the database is row number two. And in those occasions, you tend to let the database allocate your primary key. But if you do that, it means that in your program, your object doesn't have a primary key in the database until you've saved it because the database needs to allocate it. That causes some interesting complications because, well, if you want to put this object into a collection like a hash map, how do you describe its identity? How do you say, get this one? if it's not got its ID yet, because its ID is allocated by the database and you haven't saved it. Um, one of the ways around this is to use what's called a universally unique identifier, which is what we will do is instead we won't have sequential IDs, we will have IDs that are very often an astronomically big random number, like java.util.uuid.randomuuid.toString, and that astronomically big random number is astronomically unlikely ever to get issued again by another call to that to that function so we don't need to worry about key collisions we can just allocate it up on the client and that's its id and then it goes into the database um, those are those they, they take a bit more space um, one of the questions that you tend to get around them is around the data structures on disk for the database how to optimize the storage because if it's randomly allocated you can't guarantee that more recent objects have higher IDs. Um, but you can come up with other UUID mechanisms. The way IDs are done in MongoDB is close, but not quite, to that UUID idea. Um, it has a, if you save an object that doesn't have an ID, it will allocate one. But you can also ask the database driver, which is callable up in your code, to allocate an ID for you because it has a simple way of allocating a data, uh, a UU, uh, not quite your UID. Uh, it's an object ID that has a low probability of collision within your application. Um, it's not universally unique, but it's at least application unique. Um, and so this format has 12 bytes. Um, the first uh, four bytes, I believe, is the number of seconds since January the 1st, 1970. So the seconds of the, Unity e of the Unix epoch. Uh, it then has a, uh, I think it's a three byte machine ID. Uh, it then has a process ID, which is the, the, the process ID of um, the, the, the process that you're running that's currently allocating them. And it then has a counter that starts at a random number and increments every time it, uh, it allocates an ID. But so the idea there is that you can have uh, even different servers within your application and they don't need to talk to each other. They don't need to do any kind of synchronization around allocating IDs, but they're still very, very unlikely to allocate um, the same ID to different objects. And this is what one realistically looks like. Um, object ID of this big long string here. Uh, so this has the nice property that uh, you can just allocate your IDs in your code and things always have an ID and you can use the ID when you're putting them into hash maps and, and other things like this. The storage system that Mongo I, MongoDB uses, uh, it uses a format called BSON, which is binary JSON. So it is something very close to JSON. Uh, it's got some special types in it, object ID we've seen. Uh, I'll talk about date in a moment, and it's got number long as well, um, which is, well, this is how it prints out where you've got a 64-bit integer uh, from from the, uh, if you use, if, if, if you use the Mongo shell. Um, but so it has these 64-bit integers. I mentioned number long because what I'm about to say about dates, uh, which is, Sometimes you'll get people that will use a date structure for storing a date in an ISO format or something like this. Handy hint, something I have found very, very simple to do that works most of the time, uh, I've not yet hit an issue with it, is just store the date as a Unix epoch. 
milliseconds since January the 1st, 1970, in 64-bit. Um, the reason being that this tends not to change. It's kind of a, it's, it can be a de, a de facto standard format because almost everything, if you want to create a native um, date object in any given library, almost anything can convert from that long millisecond since 1970 to the date format, uh, including in JavaScript. And so I tend to just go, well, okay, um, dates, created dates, since dates, last modified dates, just store them as a long. And so if I'm sending them up to the browser to render using react.js, up in the browser, I will use the JavaScript functions to create a date in the user's local time zone, which is all set up neatly in the browser. Um, because that way you end up showing something that is in the user's time zone rather than your server's time zone uh, quite easily without having to think about much code. Uh, and it also tends, it also happens to match what uh, Beeson does internally anyway. So it does have a uh, a date data structure. But if we here see here, there's a quote from the uh, user manual for uh, for MongoDB. Beeson date is a 64-bit integer that represents the number of milliseconds since the Unix epoch, January the first, 1970. So that same long anyway. And uh, we're not going to get any Y2K issues because that results in a representable date, date range of about 280 million years into the past and future. And uh, well, if we hit a Y2K problem in 290 million years, uh, I won't be around to see it. Um, <clears throat> connecting to a database, it's similar to JDBC. You have a connection URL and uh, this is the format copy. So you can put the username password into the connection URL, for instance, and it takes the database at the end. Uh, for you working on Turing, it's actually rather sim uh, simpler. The typical port for MongoDB is 27017. Uh, we haven't set up usernames or passwords, so please don't tread on each other's data. We're the only course using um, MongoDB this term, uh, so there's nobody else's data to tread on. Um, but so what I've suggested is, as a matter of politeness, in case anyone else does want to use MongoDB, uh, use for your database uh, comp391 underscore followed by your username on Turing. Um, and so here is an example uh, there. And so 127.0.0.1 is always the machine that you're on. So on Turing, that would be Turing uh, port number and then your database name. Um, other thing to mention, you'll see the Java driver in the tutorial, um, but the so with the Java driver, the connection is thread safe. So you can create a connection once and just use it all over the place in your code um, from uh, different controller uh, controller methods without worrying about them interfering with each other. That that's how you're supposed to do it. The manual recommends reuse the connection. OK, so a few examples. I've pasted these in from a Mongo shell. Um, I can I'll, I can show you these uh, here if you like. I've installed Mongo on, on my own uh, computer. And so if we go Mongo, it will connect. And I could say use comp391. Uh, let's go W billing. And there I am. And uh, the thing I've said here is so I've said use this particular database. and if it's not there, MongoDB will create it. So there's not a special create database command that I have to invoke in this case. Similarly for a collection. So whereas you would create a table using create table in SQL, uh, for MongoDB, I can just go database dot, let's call this collection foo dot save of, and let's save a JSON object saying um, bar baz. Whoops, sorry, I accidentally hit enter too early. Right result, yep, it saved it. And now db.foo.find, there it is. So I, I haven't invoked anything special to create the collection either. Um, it's just been created because I've used it. So saving and retrieving a document, uh, database db. Uh, and that's not the name of your database, that is a, a, um, a variable that's kind of holding your database connection. Uh, and this is from the Mongo shell dot collection name, save, and basically pasted in like a JSON document. And you'll see that when I when I retrieved it, because I hadn't specified an underscore ID, it has allocated me one. For querying, 
SQL, which people use for relational databases, has all sorts of interesting, you know, select star from where, uh, has its own particular language for it. For MongoDB natively, uh, you just use partial documents. For, so the, the queries are themselves JSON documents. So in this case, uh, and apologies in that one, I've missed the opening curly brace. Um, but so let's do an example without the missing curly, curly brace. db.foo.find of bar baz. And I haven't specified everything about the document. But it's found the one that's matching. See, I hadn't specified that ID, but that's okay because bar baz, yep, matched. It found it. Um, so that, that's a simple query. And updates are also uh, done in a similar way. Um, so I could do an update that just replaces the document db.collection.update, give it my query, and give it an updated document to put in instead. And I can give it some options and say, um, Multi is to do with, well, if I find lots of documents matching that query, do you want me to just update the first one or do you want me to update all of them? And upsert is a special one for, well, I would like you to update it if you find it. And if you don't find it, create it. So you can set an option called upsert to, to do that special operation. Update it, uh, sorry, create it if it doesn't exist. Update it if it does. Um, there are some query operators, and these are done as special fields that you put into your um, your JSON document representing the query. So here I've got database.chitteruser.find, and I've looked for ones that have a name that is not in this list. Um, so I, I can compose documents that include some of these um, the, these particular kinds of query operators. Uh, similarly, I can do the same with update operators. Uh, so this is one that you might find particularly useful. Uh, well, not this one, but you'll find the equivalent useful for pushing session IDs, for instance, um, where I've said, I want to update the user with this ID, and I don't want to replace the document. What I want you to do is to push into the array, the feet, fields that's uh, uh, called identities, which is an array, I want you to push this record into that array. Uh, append it to the end of the array. And that will go in there. There's another one, add to set, which is if you want to add it if it's not already in there, but if it's in there, don't. Um, Sub-document queries. Okay, so here I've suggested, uh, let, let's sort of create this one. Let's go and um, let's create our user in our collection, because I want to show you this query live. Uh, so I've just gone and saved into a new collection called Chitter User, a user with the name Antelon Moncrief. And let's go and do this one. Uh, and we'll find out if I've made any typos when I was typing that into my, um, uh, oops, it went matched zero. Oh, of course it went matched zero because I've used the ID that I paste, uh, pasted in there. Let's instead go back to here. Uh, oops. Do pardon me. What I need to do is instead db.chitteruser.find and let's get what his new ID is. And let's go and uh, his ID this time around. So, so I said it was application unique, but if you remember, the, the ID format included the time. So running this query again, I'm very unlikely to get the same ID again. And so I need to post the ID of the user that I got this time I ran the example. There we go, modified one. That was what I was looking for. And now if I go db.chitteruser.find, there's Algernon Moncrief, and there's this identities field, which has an array, and it's got my identity pushed into it. Now, suppose someone logged in using OAuth, and I got the data from GitHub saying, yes, they've successfully logged in, and their username is Algernon, an example. How would I find a user who has the identity um, Algernon example, etc. Or for instance, how could I do a query that just finds all users that have a GitHub um, ID and uh, in that are in my database? And so the one I've suggested here is that if you want to do a simple sub-document query, if I want to find all my users who've 
had a GitHub identity pushed into that array, I can go use db.chittyuser.find identities.service is GitHub. So identities there dot service matches GitHub. So let's try that and just check that it finds it. There it is, it found it. Okay. The last thing I'd like to mention is the LM match operator. So in this case, if you use this dot notation, it expects an exact match between whatever's in this field and the value um, in uh, that ends up in you know identities.service. Sometimes you don't want to do an exact match. Sometimes identities.service or whatever whatever it is under the under the dot notation is a document and perhaps it's got a date in it and you want to query two fields but not the whole thing. Um, so there's this operator here called dollar lm match that means find me an element that matches these conditions, a single element that matches these conditions. Uh, so you might, depending on how you structure, for instance, your session object, you might find that one useful too. Um, so that was kind of talking through MongoDB, what it's about, and from the Mongo shell. Uh, in the tutorial, you'll play with this from the Java driver and doing some Java code. Uh, but hopefully you now have a, a sense of the shape of the documents. It really does look very much like JSON documents.